So we've done that. So thank you. This is just a quick overview of the agenda. So we're going to go through a bit of the metrics and reporting, um, which Laura Semple and Sue which is going to do, followed by an update on new CBD program development. And then we're going to have a nice, wonderful breakout session about listening to inspire. So really getting the chance to listen to others about what work they've been doing. Um, and then we'll share one interesting fact when we come back to the chat and then follow up by me. Next slide. So the icebreaker. So what is the biggest challenge you have in improving CV within your local area? So hopefully you've all had a chance to think about it. If you could put it in the chat box, but don't press send. That would be great. Don't press send, just write it in the chat box before and I'll tell you to press send in a minute. Right, if everyone's had a chance to write it, if you could all press send now. System change, primary care capacity, quite a lot about engagement, system capacity, again, capacity. Um, Last on modification. Yep, there's quite a lot of capacity issues in primary care. We can really see that coming through. Um, what I'll do is I will type this stuff up and it'd be quite nice just to share and then hopefully this can help future sessions and any kind of future work so we know what we're working with and just get a real understanding of what the challenges are so we can support each other to kind of help some of this stuff. So I am going to hand it over to Laura now. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Ratch. It's lovely to see everyone. Um, I think we've got even higher attendance this afternoon than we had at the first community of practice a month ago. So a very warm welcome to everyone. It's lovely to see you. And I think I know most of you. There's a couple of new faces, though, so particular warm welcome to you and looking forward to getting to know you and, and working with you. Thanks also for posting those challenges. I think there's lots of good things there that we'll pick up, um, some of which in the discussion today, and obviously we'll note others that we can't get to today for future sessions. So um, what Sue and I are going to do now is a quick recap on plans for the year and for the metrics that we're asking you all to provide on CBD. Um, and some of this will be um, a repetition from last time, um, but there have been a few questions coming up, so it felt like it'd be good to take an opportunity to have a look at this again. And um, obviously keen to hear your questions after Sue and I have spoken through the next couple of slides. So um, could you move to the next slide, please, Ratch? So this is the overview of CBD for this year, and I know that you're all familiar with this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. Um, essentially, on in Q1 and Q2, um, we've got various important activities still running on our BPO and uh, national lipid programmes. Uh, and Sue's going to tell us in more depth around Inclisaran shortly. And we've also got in a, the INHIT programme running throughout this year. And um, from October onwards, we're going to be launching the new CBD programme, which I'm going to talk a bit more about later on in today's session. Um, what I would just emphasise is that um, the national programme is changing in the ways that we're going to describe um, in, in that item later on, on the agenda. Um, but obviously all the great resources that you have on 
cholesterol and blood pressure optimization are still there and we would very much encourage you to continue to promote those in your local systems because we're all very aware there's still a lot to do on cholesterol and blood pressure optimization and indeed many lives to save by continuing to focus on those areas so um, we hope that that will be possible within your local program activity even when the national focus has moved on somewhat. So on to the next slide Raj. So this just displays in a Gantt chart style graphical form what I've just said on the previous slide. So you can see there that INHIP as well as the um, STF CLF workforce support uh, programmes as well as obviously all your locally agreed CVD programmes um, are continuing throughout the year and we'll come on later on in the agenda to talk about um, the new programme. Next slide Raj. So this is the same slide as I shared last time about metrics, but just as a quick recap on this, um, for Q1 and Q2, the um, lipid pathway stages of adoption metrics are the same as you've been completing for quite some time now. Um, so you'll expect to see that in the um, Q1 quart, which I, if you've not already started um, inputting into, I know you will be shortly. And for blood pressure optimization, we're keeping it nice and easy. It's the same. We're asking you to complete the same spreadsheet as you have been for the past year. The only thing that's changed there is we're asking you to supply that completed spreadsheet back to a different person. As you know, Kate Phillips is now on maternity leave and our colleague Sophie Powell, who works with me in the HSN Network Central team, has very kindly agreed to collate those returns from all 15 AHSNs. And once Sophie's done that, um, Unity Insights will be doing their analysis on that data that you've provided in the usual way. So thank you very much for doing that uh, and submitting to Sophie. Um, then the third point on there is, um, as you'll be aware, we've got lots of um, webinars. For example, um, UCL partners have been running webinars monthly, um, which you can invite all your local stakeholders to, clinicians and others, to support them with the implementation of the um, blood pressure optimization framework. And we're obviously just keeping an eye on how many people attend those from each area so that we can see there being well used um, and same for lipids and but but the point I want to emphasize on that is that is not data you need to supply we're able to collect that centrally and that takes us on to Inclisiran, um, the detail of which is in the next slide if you could move on Rach and I'm going to hand over to Sue to talk through that. Yeah lovely thanks thanks Lauren thanks Rach. Um, yeah, so if you don't know me, Sue Critchley, National Programme Manager for the Lipids and FH Programme for the um, Novel Therapies Element and Education. So I've met most of you and some of you here, face I haven't seen for a while, so it's really nice to be in the room. Thank you. I think you've seen this slide before. So this gives an overall um, narrative of the reporting required for InfoSRAM. So there are programme-wide key performance indicators which are used to help inform all your assurance oversight group meetings if you haven't had one of those yet they are coming your way and nico will have been in touch to arrange one if you've not had any communication it's not because we've forgotten we've just got a lot of these to get into the diary and they're quite difficult to coordinate but that's coming so the program wide kpis there are seven of those they are not within this deck i don't think they have been shared a number of times and i'm going to talk about them again in an hour um, but there are only two of those that re require each individual AHSN to send in to us. Um, so they are the number of PCNs at each stages of adoption and the comms and education reports. So the last one is the most important one to us currently. So we've written out and asked everybody to return a template that harvest all the absolutely phenomenal education and communications activity that every single AHSN has been delivering on lipids. Um, we are asking that you put in links to web pages, comments if files uh, are um, held within your own drives, 
You'll include everything, even if it's a checklist or a competence list. We want to harvest these and gather them in one central place so that everybody gets access, everybody can see where they exist. We don't have lots of different lipid programming and clisteran program managers having to do desktop researches to see whether it's already been invented. And the ones that are pertinent on a national scale will be coming back and seeking permission to, to hold those in a central repository. So those are programme wide KPIs, the seven of them. We gather the five of them together. There's two that you, we are dependent on you to return to us and they're all sent out from Nico and um, everyone's doing a great job at returning those. So thank you. Then we also have monthly, quarterly end of project reports for each of the System Transformation Fund and the Collaborative Lipid Funds projects. Again, they are used to inform assurance oversight group meetings and where appropriate, we will um, share elements of those probably on an exception basis further up the reporting scale. So into Joint Steering Committee and the uh, new, new to be CBD programme board in the future. Um, there is also a national liquid programme workforce support programme, which was the um, goods and services offer directly to primary care networks to receive pharmacy supplier boots on the ground support in the practices, either from Saw Beyond or Interface Clinical Services. There are no reporting requirements with that, apart from we know that you're all involved in troubleshooting um, at times, and we just ask that you uh, report those back to me on an informal basis. And then there are also additional partnership agreements. Uh, so the business as usual, Novartis or industry related uh, joint working partnerships. So there's no reporting requirements for those as well. But this slide is an overview of all the ongoing work, the funded programmes and the reporting requirements. I'm happy to take any questions right now because I know there's quite a lot on one slide. Do you want to put your questions in the chat, please do, or please, um, which Sue can answer? Or if you've got anything to shout out, raise your hand. I'm happy to take any questions too. And uh, in my book, there's no such thing as a stupid question. So if you're not sure about anything, please speak up. Can I use the silence as an opportunity to give a bit more information that's not on the slide? That, thanks, Raj. Yeah. Um, there is a on the inclus around workspace on futures there has been um a fantastic inclus around prescribing dashboard um that i think practically every lipid program manager has used in the past and it was taken down or it wasn't taken down exactly but the nhs england improved their security access measures to use their tableau uh, dashboards and so if you have found that you have lost access to the prescribing dashboard, it's simply because you need to click a support button on the landing page or follow an instruction, which should be on your screen when you land in the workspace. And that will give you access to the dashboard back. Um, your efforts will be rewarded because the dashboard's improving all the time. And you'll see that there's more and more data in there that's really worth um, getting into. So if you haven't uh, realise that that disappeared, well it has, uh, and when you go back and have a look for it, you know, there are a couple of steps that you need to go through to get registration back on, so um, I think the, the comms around that has probably come out at a, a time when a lot of other things were coming out as well, so it's been missed, um, so that's everything from me, thank you. Thank you. Next slide. We've done that, so <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> I want to hand over to Laura to give you a bit of an update on the new CVD programme development. Thanks, Ratch. Um, just before I dive into that, I just want to check there weren't any questions on metrics. And Di, don't worry, I can't hear any background typing noise. I just wanted to check that you weren't trying to type a question that I'm now going to miss. Looks like no, all fine, excellent. Okay, great stuff. Oh, I can see one hand. Um, Mary Joel. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I was a bit late. Was was raising my hand. Um, and apologies if I've missed it. But is there a deadline 
to return the blood pressure optimization sheet? And will we get a reminder? Because Kate was absolutely brilliant and sending us reminders yeah. and the sheet um, in advance and so on. Thank you. Yeah, um, really good point. Um, the short answer is just as soon as you can after the end of the quarter, which is obviously tomorrow, the 30th of June. But we will get um, a reminder note sent out. And would people find it helpful to have the template attached to that? Yes, please. I certainly would. Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. OK, no problem. We, we can do that. Excellent. Thank you so much. There's another question, Karen. Hi. Um, yeah, in terms of the BPO, so am I right in think we don't have targets for this quarter, do we? We had targets up until the programme sort of ended as we knew it. But we don't have, so we're, re we're reporting just on sort of distance travelled since the last yeah. quarter, but there's no real metrics to... So I, I might ask um, Laura and Ratch to come in on this in a second, um, but yeah, essentially... Um, we're just keen to track how the adoption's been progressing over the last few months. There's not a target as such. I guess the hope is just that everyone is, um, you know, still being reasonably ambitious and still promoting it in their in their area. I think we're promoting it, but it's very difficult to establish awareness. You know, we've had this debate throughout yeah. the programme, really. How do we know which PCNs are are implementing the framework and and whatever so we'll do it to the best of our knowledge but it's not going to be that scientific so i come in um and, and hopefully laura semple will kind of agree with what i'm saying but i think when we talked about what this kind of six month bridging would look like we really focused on how do we make this sustainable so this is around how do we hand the program and the work that's been kicked off to the local systems hence the focus on the impact report and the implementation webinars so for to do discussions, Laura, we, we thought this would be a great way to just maintain that evidence base about who's using it as far as we know. So that later down the line, when we come to wider evaluation of HSM programmes, can we see a correlation between people doing activity and improved outcomes? That's exactly it. Thanks, Laura. You've explained that more eloquently than I did. So thank you. Um, I've just seen uh, so the question in the chat from Ellie uh, for you, Sue. Do you want to answer that one? Sue, so you're mute. I'll put the link in here right now. Thank you. Okay, so I think. Have we covered that, Sue? Sorry, might not have heard fully. Um, the question, uh, a reminder of how to access the, the oh, national the dashboard. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. It's a it's a future workspace. Um, you'll come. I don't mind screen sharing if you want right now. If that, if that helps people, very very quick. What it looks like when you land. Yeah, thanks, Rach. I'll just. I yeah, don't want to spend too long doing this in your meeting. There we go. Okay, so uh, when you land, it's a Implement and Cluster on Implementation Programme workspace. It looks like this when you land. You won't, and not everybody will see all of these folders. Um, some of them are access to programme and tripartite teams only. But basically, the Inclusive on dashboard now looks like that. Now I can sign in. I've got a sign in, so I can sign into that. And I've got another screen now on my second screen that's asking for my sign in. But you, if you haven't been through the process of requesting access, there will either be um, down here in the bottom right a message to say um, you need to register for an Okta account, or you can press the support button down there and it, it should work. So basically, it looks completely blank. It may even look as though there's nothing there at all if you haven't re-registered and you just need to follow the instructions. But then if there are problems then doing that, then we can help you problem solve that bit um, and we can um, escalate directly up to the relevant team who can unlock any of the problems if you're finding it it's not working for you. Thanks, Sue, for that live demo. Great stuff.
I can't see any more questions. So um, yeah, it looks like we could move on to the new programme discussion, Raj, if you want to reshare. Thank you. Fantastic. So this is going to be a quite a high level intro to our thinking so far. Um, Ratch, would it be possible just to change the slide view? Just while Ratch is doing that. So um, I think hopefully all of you will know or at least have met once um, Nazish Khan, who's recently joined the Network Central team as um, clinical programme lead for cardiovascular. So Naz put together this slide and has been leading the conversations about the development of the new programme. Naz is actually on holiday today. Um, if she'd been here, she'd have been presenting this, but hopefully I'll do a reasonable enough job of it. Um, so it's just a single slide and then we'll have some time for questions. So um, the text in gold on the left won't be any surprise to anyone here around um, reducing cardiovascular disease burden through timely identification and um, treatment. And we've been looking at three main areas over the last couple of months. And this is in response to what we know of national priorities and also, also what we're hearing about system priorities locally, which obviously are not the same everywhere. Um, and this is always the task with AHSN network wide programmes to try and weave together um, the different areas of enthusiasm from different parts of the country into an offer that is you know, really attractive for as many systems as possible. So just to talk through the opportunities, um, in obesity, um, the main categories of opportunity we've been looking at have been around, um, first of all, the novel medicines, which there's been a lot of press coverage about, which I'm sure you've seen. So one of those is called semaglutide, which is manufactured by Nova Nordisk, and there are one or two others on the near horizon um, as well. Um, and uh, just an update on semaglutide, actually, we've recently heard that um, that's probably not going to be available to the NHS until Q4 or possibly Q1 next year, which means that that's not going to be the primary focus of a new programme from October. But what we are doing is staying in very close conversation with the people at NHS England and the Office for Life Sciences who are um, you know, managing those national decisions about um, the use of semaglutide so that when it is available to the NHS, the AHSNs are ready and well prepared to support the uptake of it and there are of course some really like we've got some really important learning along the way from our experience with Inclisiran and the rapid uptake products in recent years which will obviously want to apply to that when the time comes. The other great opportunities as I know you'll be aware are around digital innovation and there are, there's now a whole range of um, digital innovations to support people um, trying to lose weight and uh, many of these are already being have already been in use for some time through the NHS England weight management program and um, uh, national diabetes prevention program could we get all the words in the right order there and so there's actually a reasonable amount of real world evidence on a number of those products which we're able to refer to which is very helpful what we do know, though, is that uptake of those digital products is very variable and NHS England have indicated to us that they could see a role for AHSNs in trying to like even out that uptake a bit and the areas where, you know, we know there's real need, but for whatever reason, those digital products have not been used to the extent that they have in other areas. What can the AHSNs do to focus on those areas and support them to get more benefit from these um, products? The other really exciting element with that is the nice early value assessment process on digital weight management products. We've been speaking a lot to NICE recently, and I think there'll be some good opportunities for AHSNs um, coming out of that programme as well. Um, so secondly, um, the chronic kidney disease area. Again, I think this will be familiar to many of you. This is all about the um, early identification of people with 
chronic kidney disease in the usual way so that we can get them on effective treatment sooner, which, um, you know, should prevent more serious complications. For example, um, we know uh, in some parts of the country, dialysis services are under quite a lot of pressure and um, uh, capacity pressures. And so obviously, um, if we can keep people healthier and, you know, not get into the severity of disease where they need um, dialysis, that's much better for everyone. And th there are a number of approaches to this around using GP data to um, identify people sooner and potentially start them on treatment. There are also a number of innovations. I, I'm sure everyone's come across Healthy IO, which is the one we've mentioned here, um, which can help. Um, there's some uncertainty um, about healthy IO at the moment, which I won't go into in, in detail here, but obviously we're looking into that closely. And then finally, um, heart failure, um, which again, I know lots of you will be familiar with and some of you have done local programmes in heart failure. Um, as with the other areas, there's a huge amount to do here. And I've been on a rapid learning curve about heart failure because it's not an area I've worked in before. Um, but in essence, um, we know that there are many more patients with heart failure than numbers on GP registers. And that's based on our estimates of prevalence. And so what we're thinking about here as a first part of the program is simplifying the diagnosis and um, diagnostic process and shifting the diagnostic tools for heart failure um, into community settings is a great opportunity here. So um, there's something called, just referring to my notes here, um, NT Pro BNP, which is a biomarker for heart failure. That's either a lab test. Um, there are also various point of care test offers for that. Um, but in many places, GPs have no access to ProBNP. Pro -BNP. Um, also, there's some opportunities around point of care ultrasound. So having ultrasound equipment that's just portable and small equipment that's available in the community setting, therefore avoiding a referral to hospital. Um, and ultrasound echo is a gold standard diagnostic for heart failure. So some really interesting opportunities about um, having that more portable equipment available in a community setting, which should enable us to speed up diagnosis. So that's the first part about finding the missing patients. The second part, be no surprise to anyone here, is medical optimization. So like many other cardiovascular conditions, even when we've got a diagnosis, many patients are poorly optimised medically and would benefit from additional treatment. And the evidence of some of these treatments has only emerged more recently um, because um, in a couple of cases, the drugs were initially used um, in diabetes and um, new evidence has emerged recently. So, for example, um, the SGLT2 medicines or the gliflozin medicines. So there's quite a few opportunities there as well based on the latest research. Um, so where we are at the moment is it feels like um, heart failure is probably the strongest candidate out of these three for um, implementation as a new AHSN programme from October, which I think is really exciting. And we've mentioned here on the slide the OPERA project, which has been done in Glasgow along the lines that I've described. And so we're able to draw on the evidence that they've got on their experience of implementation. Um, and at the next meeting of this community, um, Naz will be here and will be able to talk in a bit more detail about um, everything that might be involved in, in heart failure and indeed the other areas. The other point I wanted to say is that um, we've still got some way to go on the thinking here, but it may be that we approach this in a similar way as we have for the polypharmacy and the transforming wound care programmes, where it's not a case of all 15 AHSN starting the same thing at the same time. Um, dependent on local system appetite, um, there may be an opportunity to have, say, six or seven AHSNs doing heart failure, three or four doing obesity, 
potentially others doing CKD, but still forming part of a really tight CBD learning collaborative, share the learning as we go and where we've got successful innovations, obviously rolling them out to the HSNs that weren't in the phase one. So all of that um, thinking we still need to go through, but I think there are some good opportunities there for marrying up um, you know, the nationally supported innovations with where the local system appetite is. And um, my final point to make, so no fairly short of time, is that we really do want to hear all of your ideas, thoughts, suggestions, questions on these. And um, Naz is going to be in touch with you fairly soon um, about joining some task and finish groups to help us explore the remaining questions and due diligence on these candidate innovations. So really look forward to hearing more from you there. Um, but I'm really happy to uh, respond to any initial questions on what I've said today. And obviously over the next few weeks, you know where I am and feel free to get in touch. Laura. Um, thanks so much for that, Laura. Um, really exciting and really helpful. Can I just ask, if it is something like the Healthy IO, do you think there'll be funding made available to support sites um, adopt in the first instance? Or do you think this will be around HSNs making the case for adoption? Just, just think about Healthy IO. Obviously, it's a private company. Um, innovation costs money. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm not aware of any additional funding that would be made available in the short term, um, but that could change, Laura. I've seen a question in the chat from Di uh, about heart failure. Uh, question about care plans are you talking about sort of personalized care plans for people with heart failure yeah so gm has um, um an ics level care plan and that's been worked up over the last few years right. um digitization of that care plan is in progress now so i'm just wondering if that is yeah something that we could share but also something that is worthwhile to, to think about really yeah great to hear about that die um would it be possible to share that with me and Naz, the perhaps the sure. Sure. analog version for now. Yeah. Then we can get familiarised with it and no, I'll uh, get yeah, onto build, it next week. No build problem. that into the thinking. That's great. Yeah. Thanks, Di. Okay. And if, you know, likewise, um, if you've got local programmes on any of these areas that you think Naz or I potentially don't already know about, we'd love to hear about them. Any other questions? Can't see any hands, Ratch. So uh, I think we might be okay to move on to the breakouts. Brilliant. So before I put you in the breakout room, I'm going to get you in your groups to discuss each person to get a chance to share the work they are doing to support CBD within their region or their area, should I say, um, and the rest of the group just to listen. So it's really about really taking the time to listen to the individual person and then hopefully having a couple of minutes for each person to have a go. So each group should have about six people in there. So we could work out two or three minutes per person. And then we'll come back and if um, each person could share one thing that, you know, that they want, that was interesting or that they learnt um, when we come back. So I'm going to attempt to put fingers crossed now, attempt to break our rooms. Should put you in now, fingers crossed. Sorry about this one. So some of you were put in and some of you weren't. Yeah, I think some people have headed off into the virtual space, but some of us are still here. Okay, this one. 
Very strange. I went to room four, but nobody joined me. And then oh. I suddenly went to a black screen and I'm back with you all. All right, let's let's try this again. Open them all. Glad you found the way back, Carolyn. Not nice Lost to be lonely over there, the is it? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Well, I had a very strange experience recently where I had the same link as everyone else for a meeting, but I ended up in a different place for all of them. So strange things happen. So the rest of so there are a few that haven't been assigned. I don't, I don't know what's going on with this today. Just please forgive me. I would offer to help Ratch, but I'm not sure what I'm able to do from my end. I mean, if if it's not going to work, Ratch, we could just have An open one larger group. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that might be. Right, good idea. Let's try that. Sorry, I don't know what's happening with this. And my computer has been playing for the last week and a half, so I'm really sorry. Don't worry, Ratch. These things happen. Technology. I think maybe the tech doesn't like the heat. Yeah, I think I think so. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, instead of going into breakout rooms for some strange reason, it's only assigning half the group, and the other half are staying in this room. So we thought we could have an open discussion. Um, and and actually have a discussion about, you know, what's worked well. So I'm does someone want to nominate themselves um, and share something that they're proud of that they've done within their area? I'm just going to close my eyes and pick somebody. Which, oh, thank you, Kate. I'm happy to go. So <laughs> Um, yeah, just really. So this is um, from North East North Cumbria. We've been sort of doing some work around pharmacy technicians and pharmacy technicians working in the lipid pathway. So this is about um, utilising their skills and doing obviously they can't cannot prescribe, but they can do a lot of work around um, the triaging searching through um, the patient lists and the work that we've done here is now starting to be spread out more so we've developed lots of resources we've got about 13 different documents um, from sort of spreadsheets um, through to pathways to help people to do that so the work was sort of um, started in one sort of practice but we've now started to develop um, relationships with other pharmacy technicians who are um, some of which is work that's being done through the HSN some who've just heard that we've got a community of practice and um, want to just get involved so you know particularly now that um, uh, cholesterol is part of COF. There's a lot more interest than there was. Um, it would have been really helpful if uh, COF had aligned with the national programme <laughs> three years ago. Um, so I just sort of feel that we're starting to get motoring really with a lot of that now. There's a lot more interest. Um, so that work, you know, I can we've had interest as well from other parts of the country on the work that we've done with that. And I think that's going to um, help people be able to achieve what they need to achieve with quaff and, and with lipids and making a difference to patients. Certainly just recently, in fact, it was a meeting this morning, I had somebody who was saying to me that there isn't a lot of opportunities for pharmacy technicians in terms of development. And she very much welcomed that opportunity to be involved more in this. So we're now looking at a model that potentially where we can scale it more because we can't do everything ourselves. So, you know, this is sort of emerging work, if you like, but, you know, we're really pleased at how that's going and how that's developed. Thank you so much. That's brilliant. That's really great to hear um, that, you know, coffee's starting, like you said, to law of making a difference. Um, uh, I can't see no hands. Anybody else would be really interesting to hear what's been happening. Ellie, thank you. 
I don't mind going. Um, so we um, are, as part of our combined um, lipids funding project, just in the process of um, establishing our virtual MDT clinic approach, which is really exciting. It's sort of our um, second step to our local lipids in FH steering group. And we've had really um, great interest from our, our ICB colleagues and partners. So um, we'll be really happy to share what we're doing, um, both with this group and um, through the um, CLF um, groups as well but we're just in the phase of um we've uh, explain to the Lipids and FH steering group what our priorities are for CLF this year and ask them to just um, have a think about their availability to support as a bank of specialists towards our MDT and then we're just um, putting together the uh, resource pack and information to support the MDT approach so that we can go out to the ICSs with um, uh, some analysis we've done around the 10 PCNs in each system that we'd like to start working with. We've benchmarked data around um, in Clisran and all of the other um, lipid lowering therapies that we've got data on through the RUPS and um, CBD Prevent. And then we're using that to build a profile of uh, their local lipids pathway and map that against um, uh, health inequalities in the lowest 20% of practices as well. So um, we're excited to see how it goes and happy to share. Um, and our plan is to be running six weekly uh, virtual MDTs in each system once we're up and running. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Um, Rob, you had a question for, or did you want to go next? No, it was just I was. I'm happy to share an update in in a minute. I didn't have a specific question. You have a specific question? Sorry. No, I didn't have. Okay. So, Laura, did you have a question? Sorry, I'll come back to you, Rob. Yeah, if you don't mind, Rob, I might just jump in and ask Ellie. And um, thank you. I mean, that just sounds fantastic. And like you say, Ellie, how exciting that that's about to get up and running. I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about how you prioritised. I think it was 10 PCNs in each system. I'm yeah. sure everyone would find that quite useful to hear. Yeah, of course. So um, we've been working with uh, Unity Insights, um, who many of you know is our evaluation partner. Um, and we started by using, um, so Jen, before I started working on CBD with her, had done a huge amount of work to establish a local KSS dashboard for CBD. Um, so we've got um, open prescribing and CBD prevent data in there um, around medications such as Inclisiram, PCSK9, um, high intensity statins, benfidoic acid, etc. Um, so we've sort of done a bit of a matching exercise between the data that we get um, through open prescribing and CBD prevent for that dashboard, and then also the um, ordering data and information that we get through um, Nico and Sue and the team and the RUPS data, um, and then. And we've sort of combined that into an analysis um, so that we've got an anonymised table. So the PCNs and the ICBs themselves won't see the data figures, but we've sort of put together a bit of a traffic light system um, so that we've got one combined table with 10 PCNs for each ICB who are the lowest in terms of ordering or prescribing data. Um, and then we've kind of got like a tick box uh, next to each of those PCNs. So it is very interesting data to see because some of the PCNs, for example, might be doing really well in terms of prescribing of benfidoic acid, but maybe very low in inclisiran, just as an example. And so you can start to see um, you know, how the local pathway looks a little bit. Um, and that does support some of those clinical conversations that Jen and Richard have been having around, you know, areas where we may be struggling a little bit within Clisran, but we can see they're doing really well on um, some of the other uh, lipid medications. So I'd be happy to share a, um, like a screenshot or something of that table if that would be helpful for colleagues. Um, but we just wanted to start to build a bit of a picture um, and use it as, a, as somewhere to start with our MDT approach so that we're going where there's the most need. And then hopefully we'll start to um, kind of pair up or group PCNs together um, for the MDTs so that there's, you know, cross learning and sharing of case studies. Thank you, Sue. Oh, yeah, just brilliant. That's fantastic, Ali. And um, my uh, request, play begging. Um, almost is it, that's so good could you maybe summarize it on one slide yeah of the course. method and we could mm -hmm. um we could turn it into like an implementation report 
um, forward slash case study, but not an end to end case study, but basically mm -hmm. just something that we can circulate how so that others who are don't really know where to start. I mean, you've, you don't even know where to start. You've, you've housed, you've, you've mined all the data, you've analysed it, you've got it in a presentable format. It's really quite advanced. Yeah. We had an over assurance oversight group meeting with Yorkshire and Humber HSN yesterday, and they've taken a really insightful approach, really similar to yours, actually, Ellie. But they've also done a set of bar of, of, across their different PCNs so to actually who's actually performing to the upper level of quaff already, mm -hmm. and they're targeting those that work below the level of quaff. So, and we're asking them to write. I don't know if anyone from Yorkshire Humber in this room. Yeah, that's a really interesting approach. It, it's sort of the yeah. same. Same but similar, uh, similar but yeah. not quite the same, isn't it? Not. In terms of just yeah. identifying the start points, um, and something that we've felt felt there's been quite a lot of interest in from discussions with our um, with colleagues across the ICBs and primary care is that sort of input from secondary care specialists. So we're really just trying to support that integrated learning, um, and that's where we're using some of our CLF pot to support funding of those specialists at our MDT clinics and um, so they're not up and running yet but very happy to share how we're getting on when they are. Amazing. Thank you Ellie that is absolutely brilliant because I know lots of people across the country um, are struggling on where just to start and I think just giving them that guidance would be really yeah. supportive um, especially with some of the people we're working in in London for ourselves and um, they're struggling on just where to start so I think that'd be really useful. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm going to say one thing, Ellie, if you don't mind. I know there are a few people who would love to have a, a conversation with you about this. Um, if you're happy to, I can put you in touch with these people who are struggling, if that's OK. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll put my thank email you. in the chat. And um, we'll also, because this is related to our CLF projects specifically, we'll also continue to share through um, Sue and Nico and that group as well, um, so that everyone can see what we're up to. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, Rob, I think, was next. Hi, everybody. Uh, I, <clears throat> I was just going to update you on. We've been working with a GP federation in mid Hampshire to support them with the rollout of a secondary prevention cardiovascular risk review pathway. A project, a collaborative working project with Novartis, uh, which has been working really well. They're working with 14 of the 18 GP practices and within their remit for PCNs. And the kind of exciting news that we've got now is we've got interest from the Dorset system to potentially look at rolling out a similar model in their area using the GP Alliance there that covers all 18 PCNs in Dorset, starting off with one or two as pilot, pilot sites. But we've come across uh, the obstacle of the LMCs and their pushback against prescribing directly in primary care. And uh, this is a, uh, a model that they're actually supportive of. So we've got the support of the GP Alliance, the support of the local LMC, and we've got meetings over the next couple of weeks to see if we can, uh, how, we can how we can pursue it and hopefully get it up and running. There's a, long, a lot of work to do. Uh, in the meantime and around that, and Sue knows we've had an issue, ongoing issue around uh, federations not being able to hold a GMS or a PMS contract in terms of prescribing. And there have been concerns raised about that in Dorset, but we actually have a, a working group that Sue sits on with Michael Ridgewell, where we're looking at potential uh, models to overcome that and to allow federations and other organisations to be able to uh, deliver at scale in, in kind of hub hub sort of location so now it's it's a really exciting uh development that we can hopefully help us to uh yeah to uh, deliver better lipid management in dorset and uh, utilize resources and utilize the alliance to take the pressure off uh, primary care a little bit and i've also written I've, we've also produced an implementation report on the mid hampshire healthcare service that's just been signed off and published in the last week or so. So I'm happy to put a link to that in the uh, in the chat so you guys can all have a look and see what the pathway looks like and their experiences and the challenges that they overcame in the in the early days on that project. Thank you, Robert. That would be helpful. Um, any kind of, you know, reports and implementation, that's the whole point. I think this is the whole reason for this kind of COP is to share learning. And, and so if there are things um, and, and documents and reports you want to share, please, I'm happy to share them. So if you want to email them over to me, um, even if it's not, you know, 
on the day of the COP, even during the, during the week, please do share it with me. I'm a little bit conscious of time um, and I don't want to overrun. Was there anybody else who was burning to share? Um, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Oh, Joe, sorry. Yeah, so my, mine is more of, of an update. Um, from a Libids and FH program perspective, we, you all HSNs will soon receive an email with um, um, an expressions of interest around the evaluation of the Lipid and FH program. So this this will be going through our um, Northeast North Cumbria procurement team, then through the COMS team, and it's really just looking at elements of the Lipid program which have been delivered since October 2020 and um, what value have they added into the into program itself so uh, watch this space when they when they the call out for evaluation bids um, do do come out but the turnaround is quite um, short we do need that within the next um, four weeks in terms of uh, potential bidders then the delivery period will have to get every everything evaluated by um, by October, November. So that's just an update from the evaluation of the national program. Thank you. So just a few things from me before we close. Um, things to remember, if you could please um, fill out the feedback form. I'll share the link in the chat um, and I'll send it again when I send the email over about the recordings and the slide deck, I'll circulate as well. Um, but just to remind you, I know Laura did say earlier on in her um, in her presentation, but we have got these webinars um, on how to implement the use of partner frameworks. Um, so please do book your place if you haven't or, or forward it on to those who need to come and attend. And just a little reminder, we've got lots of resources on our use of partners website um, regarding how to implement things um, and also lots of recordings on hypertension, lipid management, FH, um, and there's lots of um, information there. So I will circulate that and hopefully the link works. Um, and I will, like I said, I will circulate the recordings for the next and send the next COP date as soon as possible um, and put it into your calendars. Um, and if there's any questions, um, please let me know. Ratch, I just wondered as we've got a couple of minutes whether we might um, pick up a couple of points around challenges that we had from the start. And because obviously a lot of these are around system capacity um, in primary care. So outside the kind of direct uh, control, obviously, of the AHSNs, but we might just come back to that one in a second. I just wondered, um, Chris, I hope you don't mind. I think you posted around kind of the, some of the thinking you're doing around how to allocate resource, given that we've got the new programme coming up. Is it? Is it helpful for us to just spend a moment on that if you want to say a bit more about it? Um, I suppose business planning was interesting for CVD um, because, you know, we have a, a lot of ongoing programmes, um, many of which we'd like to continue, but we don't know what the realities of what might be future expectations. Um, and where to transition stuff that was national work into local work in addition to a lot of the local stuff we already do which centers around a lot of education and stuff like that um so it was interesting and, and timely to hear about the potential um programs although obviously i i like many others would potentially be keen to know um a, a rough finger in the air sort of around whole time equivalent requirements yeah. and that kind of thing um because at the minute you know our business plans could could never be one entire thing or the other it's kind of saying oh we'll have to see it's almost conditional um the way we've had to kind of set out our future planning um given things are going to happen kind of part way through this year for us so um yeah i would just say it i've had to have a, a conditional approach to the way i've planned the future right now so it could be you know, there's plenty of space in the tank for continuation of that excellent local work that we're doing and all those educational efforts that have been so fruitful in the West Midlands. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. And our systems are kind of 
are asking us about wanting to continue that and it's difficult to know how much to be able to commit to as well on on, on that in that respect um and against the backdrop of you know the hn network generally freeing us up more for local work as well and wanting us to kind of engage more with system partners i don't know how you know is it going to be simply one of those three things will become national programs or could it be more and yeah i, I would just say it's it's been the only way I've been able to tackle it is to make conditional plans, yeah. really. Yeah, th thanks, Chris. I, I hear you. Um, I used to do an equivalent role to you at HIN in South London, so I know how this is when you've got changes mid-year and it sounds to me like you're approaching it very sensibly and pragmatically. I suppose a couple of things just to say quickly. Um, cardiovascular disease is one of the three main priorities in the AHSN Network National Business Plan. Um, so obviously it is big focus and we all know the population need um I suppose my rough you know guidance to you at this point would be to say the amount of resource that you've been committing to the national blood pressure and national lipids program so far we would like to see that resource sustained um, with the new work so you know as as a rough guide um obviously it'll be a bit more clearer once we know exactly what we're asking each HSN to do um and in just on your question chris of you know how many of the things i mentioned are you going to be expected to do um i mentioned there's possibilities around this kind of cluster subnational approach but definitely from october no single ahsn will be asked to start more than one new thing in october if that makes sense um and it may be that that's um, heart failure that's a you know strong candidate as I've said we are in parallel continuing the discussions around obesity the obesity medicines digital and so on um, it may be that some AHSNs pick up the kind of digital weight management side of things sooner than heart failure depending on local need and so on um, I hope that helps to clarify a little bit, but we'll we'll continue this conversation at the next COP, which will be hopefully during the last week of July, um, isn't it, Ratch? And we'll confirm the date on that ASAP, as yeah. Ratch has said. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, Sue, as well. And thank you, everyone. It's always nice to see everybody's faces. Um, and I'll send all the information for the next COP as soon as possible. Um, enjoy your afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Raj. Thanks, everyone.